If we could just start in a few moments of silence and pray for each other. Again, I just ask your prayers for me that I can say and focus on the things the Lord wants me to focus on and use our time well. And I'll pray that you're able to hear what the Lord wants you to hear. Let's also ask for our ladies in recession. Hail Mary. Holy Grace, Lord of mercy, let us in thy house. 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 Let us in thy to start this morning continuing on the handout from yesterday, and then we'll continue this morning from the handout for today. So if you have both those handouts, that's optimal. Otherwise, you'll just have to listen more attentively, which is good practice for you anyway. On the handout from yesterday, which has interior movements up at the top of it, on page two, there's a section that says, St. Ignatius of Loyola rules for the first week. St. Ignatius of Loyola developed a quite uh, detailed and extensive, almost kind of comprehensive system focused on the question of discernment, specifically. He developed an entire 30-day retreat with at least four hour-long periods a day and a daily meeting with a spiritual director oriented to making a decision, like a major life decision, and then really being firm in that decision by the time of leaving the retreat. A system of teaching focused on that question of discernment that's uh, very robust. One of the problems is that you really have to understand the whole thing to really get the whole thing, and it's a lot. Most of us will never have the opportunity for a 30-day retreat in our lives, and so then it's a, a matter of trying to tease out some of the wisdom of St. Ignatius to be able to apply to our own spiritual lives, and I think there are some useful ways to do that. I just want to focus on some very simple points that I've found very helpful in understanding my own prayer life and also in being able to hear and guide others in their prayer lives. This is part of what Ignatius calls the instructions or the rules for the first week of the spiritual exercises. So again, that 30-day retreat consists of four weeks, which are really like four periods, but even, you know, 30 days, of course, is more than four full weeks. And in the first week, some of the ground rules, some of the foundational things to pay attention to are some of the teachings that St. Ignatius gives right up front. But I think it's helpful for us when we're looking at our interiority, just building on what I was talking about last night, how do I identify and name and understand some of the things that are happening inside of me in relationship to God? What happens when God is imparting a particular grace, for example? We can describe that in different ways when the Holy Spirit draws close to me when He shines His light on my soul, when He is inspiring me, when He's uh, teaching me something. How do I experience that in myself? Those particular moments of grace. And I think we've all had those moments in prayer at different times where we were in prayer and then very suddenly, to describe it in the most uh, bright terms, you know, we, we felt, we would say, I felt God come close to me, and I believe He spoke to me, and it was an amazing experience. I didn't hear Him with my ears, I didn't have, uh, I wasn't lifted off the ground, there weren't any sort of extraordinary events from an external perspective, but what I felt, what I experienced, what I heard, was really profound. 
So St. Ignatius gives that a name. He calls it spiritual consolation. And he says we really want to pay attention to that. That's a good thing to pay attention to and to hold on to. Sometimes we have the opposite experience where we really felt kind of pressed upon or weighed down. We felt like the, the things were very heavy and God was very distant from us. We had a particularly difficult time in prayer, heavily distracted. Well, that can be the influence of the enemy pressing in on us. And, of course, we don't want to pay attention to the kinds of things that he was saying to us. So St. Ignatius just labels these two different experiences, particularly in prayer. I think that's the best way to start understanding spiritual consolation and desolation is in those times of prayer in particular. So he gives us a, a whole description. One of the things that's very nice about this also is that in we're paying attention to our, our feelings as well as our thoughts because our bodies do tell us things. When we feel the closeness of God to us and we have those experiences periodically, we feel it. Sometimes we're moved to tears. Sometimes our hearts are uplifted. Sometimes we have a surge of joy or we feel an abiding peace. And the truth that's coming to us in those moments, again, is the kind of thing we want to hold on to. And, of course, the opposite also happens in prayer, particularly heavy and distracted, difficult, down moments. And we feel those, as well as noticing in our thoughts there are things that are not true, things that are lies. We feel a lack of hope and confidence and the presence of God. So just being able to name some of that stuff in our spiritual experience can be so helpful. So I want to read the, the description of uh, St. Ignatius. These are actually rules 3, 4, and 5. My uh, helpful word uh, application, renumber them for me, 1, 2, and 3. Anyway, uh, thank you, Microsoft Word. But uh, they're actually rules three, four, and five, and uh, are in the spiritual exercises of Saint Ignatius. It's the only book that he wrote. He wrote a number of letters of explanation and some other things, but the book, the primary book of Saint Ignatius, is the spiritual exercises. And let me just also mention that if you really want to go deep into the whole Ignatian system, which I think is a worthwhile endeavor, it is a an investment to really get your hands around the whole thing in a way that would be helpful to understand everything. Uh, Father Timothy Gallagher, I think, is the clearest teacher on all of this in, in our time. Really speaks the language, uses examples, builds a steady teaching, and he has a number of books and programs on EWTN, uh, DVDs, podcasts, all kinds of stuff. But Father Timothy Gallagher is really a great teacher of uh, Ignatian spirituality. In any event, to actually start out, right before giving the whole list of 14 rules for the first week, St. Ignatius gives us some important wisdom which just reinforces the kinds of things I was saying to you last night about interiority. So I'm just going to read right under St. Ignatius of Loyola rules for the first week. He says, These are rules for understanding to some extent the different movements produced in the soul, and for recognizing those that are good, to admit them, and those that are bad, to reject them. So we see that the first thing we have to do is actually be aware of what's happening inside of us. St. Ignatius is going to give us some language and some categories, some concepts to label some things, but we have to be aware of what's happening inside of us, first and foremost. And again, I'm thinking about all of this first and foremost in terms of our time in prayer, when we're spending that time in Eucharistic adoration, when we have times of silent meditation, especially then, to be aware of what's happening inside of us. And then these uh, rules and categories give us a way of understanding those different movements to some extent. So again, Ignatius labels some things, but he's not creating a comprehensive description of everything that happens in the human person. 
He's just trying to get his hands around the things that t generally happen when the Lord is particularly giving us a grace or when the enemy is particularly tempting us of those two categories. And then, of course, we want to really admit, take to heart those things the Lord is saying to us, those experiences in prayer, and we want to be able to recognize and reject those temptations or effects that the enemy has on us in prayer. So he describes spiritual consolation. He says, I call it consolation when an interior movement is aroused in the soul, by which it is inflamed with love of its Creator and Lord, and as a consequence can love no creature on the face of the earth for its own sake, but only in the Creator of them all. So that's one description. It's actually, it should be a bullet point list. If we were rewriting this, we would make it a bullet point list of different signs of God's particular grace acting on our soul. But the first one is that we are inflamed with love. Maybe all of you, I hope all of you at some point or another, has had that kind of experience in prayer where your heart is just so filled with love for God. And it's almost like you're, you're not physically lifted off the pew, but you almost feel lifted up inside. And it's like every, everything else becomes a little bit distant. And, and the problems and the things you have to do in the day and, and every, everything else becomes a little bit distant. And even when you think about them, you see them through God's eyes. And you see your loved ones and you see the people you're responsible for. And you see all of them through God's eyes. And that love has a way of spilling over. So that's a spiritual consolation when we have that experience of being inflamed with love, lifted up above every creature just sort of captured. In some, some places in the spiritual tradition would even call this ecstasy in various forms, the kind of being lifted up, inflamed with love. And then bullet point number two, another sign of spiritual consolation. Ignatius says, it is likewise consolation when one sheds tears that move to the love of God. That's a specific kind of tears. Tears that move to the love of God. Whether it's because of sorrow for sins, or because of the sufferings of Christ our Lord, or for any other reason that is immediately directed to the praise and service of God. So there's tears of love for God. It's not every tear that we shed. We shed tears for lots of reasons. But when those tears are connected with love of God, maybe as we're meditating on the passion of Christ, we're thinking about the ways that He suffered for us, all that He gave for us, the particular way that He loves us, and we're just, we're moved to tears. Uh, maybe not heavy weeping, just some tears as our hearts are filled up with love for Him. Or maybe as we realize, drawn so close to Him, that we suddenly see our own sins in contrast, and those things that maybe are larger or smaller, more or less significant, but we, and we feel such sorrow for them. Oh, how did I do that? How did I ever think that was okay in my life? How did I ever make such a mistake? We feel that sorrow for Him, but still connected to His love. So it's not getting lost in that sorrow or some self-condemnation or self-blame, anything like that. We just feel that contrition, those tears of contrition, compunction, as we are overwhelmed, as we're touched by His love. Then he goes on. Bullet point number three. Finally, I call consolation. Now there's a, several bullet points, really. It says, finally, I call consolation every increase of faith, hope, and love. We can think about that for a moment. Have you ever had the experience, like we had this time of Eucharistic adoration last night, even just knowing the presence of Jesus in the tabernacle, that you were there in front looking at, at Jesus and you suddenly had a deep feeling, this is the Lord. Now we all profess that, we would say that, we get the answer right on the exam, but there are some times we just go, wow, this is really Him. I'm really in the presence of God. That is a supernatural, that's an increase in faith. 
Or sometimes in the midst of our, of our very difficult trials, we're there in prayer and we're praying about some heavy situation, maybe some rupture in the family, some difficulty that we're going through, maybe some trial in the parish, and suddenly we have a surge of hope and we say, I know this is going to work out. I just know it. God is with us and he's not going to let us down. It's a supernatural surge of hope to have that deep conviction and confidence. It's God's grace at work on us. Or maybe again, moved with love. And maybe that was even the kind of thing that led to your vocation. Those of you who have said yes to being deacons, subdeacons, and those of you women who said yes to your husbands being deacons and subdeacons, it's uh, no less significant for either one of you. And maybe in that moment of confirmation, you had this surge of love for God. And you said, oh, Lord, I love you so much. I want to do anything for you. I can tell you that in my own personal vocation story. That's very much how that, that occurred. Really, the first time I was ever aware of a spiritual consolation, feeling the closeness of God to me, and then having that surge of love, knowing that I could speak with Him, that we could have a relationship, and then having this, in the midst of that, the, the thought coming to me, I could really dedicate my whole life to sharing the gift of prayer. It came right there. I remember that experience like it was yesterday, 23 years ago. Those kinds of experiences. And we want to hold on to that because there's truth that comes from that. I can tell you in the... Actually, that was a particularly grace time in my life. There were a number of consolations flowing after that as the Lord was really teaching me in a very personal way how to listen to Him and how to follow Him. But in the, in the months to come, I really lost sight of that. It became very distant to me. And it became a real struggle to hold on to that. Why was I thinking about the priesthood? What was I thinking? Did I realize that? There's like celibacy in that, you know? Uh, what's going on with that? Why would I think to dedicate my life to this? So in that confusion, we want to be able to come back to those pillars of spiritual consolation when we experience truth and we felt that and knew that, that, that surge of love. So an increase of faith, hope, and love. And then another sign, all interior joy that attracts to what is heavenly. So again, we're not just talking about the joy of, uh, I can't name a sports team here because I'll offend somebody. <laughs> but your sports team, whatever sport that is, and wherever you're from, you know, it's not just the joy of winning the Super Bowl or the joy of winning the World Cup or the joy of, those are wonderful joys. But this is the interior joy that invites and attracts to what is heavenly. That joy that surges up as I say, I'm just so glad I'm Catholic. I just love my faith. It's just, this is wonderful. It's wonderful to be together. It's wonderful to celebrate the liturgy. The surge of joy that fills up, wells up in our hearts. And the last, and this is perhaps also the most common that we become aware of moving forward, St. Ignatius says, and to the salvation of attracts to what is heavenly and to the salvation of one's soul by filling it with peace and quiet in its creator and lord and that's again now there's the there's the peace of uh, your children finally falling asleep you know that's one kind of peace but there's the kind of peace that when we're here maybe you experienced that even last night we're here in the presence of the blessed sacrament and, and even in the midst, sometimes we're there praying, and there's all kinds of stuff going on in us. And we're getting pulled here, and I'm to thinking of the seven things I gotta do when I gotta get home, when I get home, and my phone buzzes three times, and, and then I'm starting to you know, fade away and, and fall asleep, and then I wonder how long this is gonna last, and it's only been three minutes, you know. And, I, you know we have, and then suddenly in the midst of that, it's like all of the water's calm, and I'm present. drawn to the Lord. Now the kinds of things that I hear in that space, I want to pay attention to that. That's the kind of peace and quiet that we, that we really want to pay attention to. 
So I, I try to describe spiritual consolation, and again, I, I'm not, I'm only giving a name to something, maybe a name that you already know anyway, but giving a name to something that we've all experienced as we've been about this prayer life for a while, as we've taken times in, in prayer. And one of the key points is, when we experience that consolation, God is doing something in us. Sometimes He's bringing some healing to our hearts. Sometimes He's speaking truth to us. Like I said, that thought came to me, I could spend the rest, I could dedicate the rest of my life to sharing the gift of prayer. I never forgot that thought. I didn't know how importantly to take that, because I didn't understand some of this teaching. God was kind and merciful and helped me to hold on to that. I'll, I'll tell you though, it actually took me about 17 years to figure out that, that that's exactly what he was doing already. I, I translated that thought too quickly into evangelization. And I kept looking for evangelization. How was I going to... I looked at a religious order that was doing street evangelization and, and, and doing more uh, explicit evangelization because I turned that into evangelization. It was in a setting like this that I was recounting my story and I, I said, yeah, and the Lord, I really, I really had the thought I could dedicate my, the rest of my life to sharing the gift of prayer. Hey, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> That's how sometimes the Lord helps us in spite of ourselves. I kept thinking I was still yet to fulfill this uh, vocation, and in fact, the Lord fit me right into the place in spiritual direction and teaching spirituality. Everything I'm doing is really about sharing the gift of prayer. So, we want to hold on to those truths that we experience in those times of spiritual consolation, and we also want to hold on to the Lord's presence. Now, we don't get to hold on to the experience. Spiritual consolation is a created reality. It's really a gift for us. And we don't want to hold on to the gift instead of the giver. But just like you hold on to those beautiful moments in your marriage, honeymoon moments, and moments when you were close to each other, moments when there was real mutual understanding, moments of, of deep love, we want, to hold, we want to remember those, and we want to let them really sink into our hearts. We can really place our trust in God's love and presence in those moments. And so we want to really soak that in. That's one of the things that St. Ignatius teaches us in the later rules. When we have that, those moments of spiritual consolation, soak it in with deep gratitude and hold on to any truths that have sort of emerged into that space. Very important. And... As we become more aware, as we press more into our spiritual lives, as we become more sensitive, we start to become more aware of the subtle spiritual consolations that God gives us throughout the day. I don't want to say too much more about that right now, but just to say, the Lord does impart little graces that we can become more sensitive to, but good to start with the big obvious ones that we can experience in prayer, and to really soak that in and hold on to that truth. And when we're discerning big questions, and I'm sure already people have asked you a thousand times, Father, deacon, subdeacon, how do I know when, when God is speaking to me? And a simple response is, well, what was your experience when that was happening? When you were hearing those thoughts, when you were getting that word in your heart, what was your experience? And if we start to see the experience of spiritual consolation around those moments, that's going to give us a lot more confidence. That's God that's speaking. When God speaks to us, naturally it flows over into the rest of our person because we are body and soul. And so that communication to the soul has a way of spilling over into that inflamed love or increased hope or the tears that move us or the joy or peace that we're filled with as we're attracted to God and lifted up in His presence. So when someone describes to you an experience like that and they say, and this, this word was coming at the same time, well, that's good. We want to pay attention to that. Take that very seriously. Now, of course, we, we want to check out every word against divine revelation. And, you know, God is not going to tell you that He's actually four persons. doesn't matter what you're feeling. He's never going to tell you that. So... We're always keeping within the boundaries of sacred scripture and the moral law and everything else. But, you know, when he's giving a personal vocation, 
For example, if I had described my experience to someone and they said, well, I think that surge that you felt within you, those words that came to you, you could dedicate the rest of your life to sharing the gift of prayer. I think you really want to hold on to that. Let's take that really seriously. So that's a way that we can use some guidance with people. Let's look at the opposite. The opposite is spiritual desolation. And St. Ignatius describes this, and again, probably it'll bring to mind memories, uh, maybe of this morning, or yesterday, or last week, or last month, or whatever. These are particularly intense times of the enemy who does want to interfere with our relationship with God. He also acts on us at different times. So, I call desolation what is entirely the opposite of what is described in the third rule. That's the one we were just reading on consolation. I call desolation what is entirely the opposite of what is described in the third rule as darkness of soul, turmoil of spirit, inclination to what is low and earthly, restlessness rising from many disturbances and temptations, which lead to want of faith, want of hope, want of love. The soul is holy, slothful, tepid, sad, and separated, as it were, from its Creator and Lord. For just as consolation is the opposite of desolation, so the thoughts that spring from consolation are the opposite of those that spring from desolation. So, we're talking about spiritual experiences here. Again, this is not a, we're not talking, well, anyway, so let me just say that. We're, we came into prayer feeling just fine, and as we got into prayer, we started to experience this darkness of soul this turmoil of spirit as there's restlessness inside of us and things pulling apart, inclination to what is low and earthly as we start thinking in prayer, gosh, I just uh, wonder if I can just start lunch now, you know, uh, or, uh, you know, that, that uh, the game is on, maybe I could just switch out, we could just finish prayer now, or like, gosh, it's just so boring and, uh, Maybe I'm just going to find something else to do. Maybe just take a walk instead. Maybe it'll help if I just pray somewhere else and uh, leave what I'm doing now. These are the kinds of things that start to act on us as we, as we feel like restless and, and, and kind of all over the place. Even disturbed and tempted. Sometimes the thoughts that come in prayer, sometimes we're embarrassed about them. We wonder where in the world they're coming from and you know, why, am I, why am I thinking about that? Uh, we feel this want of faith. What, if, what is this worth anyway? I mean, is any of this real? Right? We can find ourselves wondering this, feeling this. Is, I don't think any of this is going to work out. My prayer is so useless. I'm just wasting my time here. And then the, the things, you know, my co-worker was right. There is no God. <laughs> I, you know, what, what difference does it make? I do all this praying and nothing ever changes. So we can feel this kind of heaviness, darkness, disturbance, a want of love. I just don't feel anything for God. I wonder if I've ever loved Him. This is just all useless. We can feel a slothful, tepid, lukewarm. It's a sadness that's a kind of heaviness, not a sadness like mourning something that should be mourned. Sadness has a, a very good quality. This is a, a sadness of God doesn't exist, and there's no hope in the world, and, and uh, it's all a waste of time, and separated, as it were, from our Creator and Lord. So, hopefully it's giving you a sense of that kind of heaviness, the sort of distraction that's, uh, that's really pulling us away from God, that leads to that want of faith and hope and love, and it makes us really want to leave. We start thinking about maybe leaving the service of the church, maybe some big decisions, uh, maybe leaving our family, maybe leaving for a, a, a time away, maybe leaving, just leaving our prayer time, maybe, you 
know, giving up on things. We can feel a lot of that heaviness. And when that's coming from the enemy, it's going to come together with all of that heaviness. That's why we're paying attention to these things. If the enemy is speaking to us, we're not going to filled up, be filled up with love for God. We're not going to be filled up with joy and peace. When the enemy is speaking to us, it's going to come together with all of this kind of heavy, dark, doubtful, hopeless, goes together with God. Now, anyway, so again, that's not to say that there, there are uh, also psychological factors and emotional factors that make us feel heavy. And, and there are times to be prudent in terms of dealing with sickness and getting psychological counseling and things like that. But we're talking about otherwise being in a healthy place, but we go into prayer and things really start to weigh down on us. So that's a description, seeing that contrast, a description of spiritual desolation. And St. Ignatius gives us a very simple rule that's worth holding on to, which is the next, which is rule number five. And he says, when you're in a time of desolation, don't change your spiritual plans. So that's not the time to discern your vocation. That's not the time to decide that prayer is not for you. That's not the time to uh, either decide to pray three hours more or three hours less. That's not the time to decide that you're not going to fast ever again or that you're going to, you know, it's not the time. Don't make decisions in spiritual desolation about your spiritual plans. The good spirit guides and counsels us. So in desolation, the evil spirit guides and counsels. Following his counsels, we can never find the way to a right decision. So we don't want to give in to that desolation. We came into, uh, we're going to have some more time for prayer after this, or, or maybe even some of you signed up for spiritual direction felt that that was the right thing to do, and then you start to get overwhelmed with this sort of fear and sadness and darkness, and you say, ah, I better, I better just not go to that spiritual direction today. Well, if you signed up when you were in a good place, and maybe even feeling a little bit inspired by that, like, yes, this is the thing to do. I, I really feel like I can open my heart to Father Tom, or to Father Boniface, or to Sister Faustine, or Sister Mary Catherine, you know, I really feel like I can open my heart to them and share with them my spiritual struggle. And then we start to have this overwhelming, all of these doubts and fears and hopelessness and all this stuff starts to set in. Carry on with that first resolution. Carry through with that. Persevere with that. Or likewise, you're, you, you've made a, maybe from this weekend, you really are you're caught up in a moment in prayer and you really feel like, you know, I've been been saying it for a long time, and then uh, Father Tom reaffirmed it when he was talking with me, and I'm really going to make that commitment to spend a, a half an hour in prayer, and I want to do that, you know, as much as I can, as reasonably possible in the days forward, and then you start walking out of here, and you just get sort of overwhelmed with this, like, ah, oh, that's going to be such a waste of time, it'll be so hard, and I don't know what I was thinking, and you can just go that's the, the enemy can really tempt our good resolutions made in a good place spiritually, made with, you know, even especially with our spiritual director, shared with the spiritual director, we can start to doubt and have despair. And it's not the time when we're heavy, dark, doubtful, despairing. It's not the time to make those decisions about our spiritual life. We want to keep persevering, pressing through, sustaining that. In those, in those heavy times. So, just a, just a little bit of wisdom from St. Ignatius, I think can go a long way for us. And being able to identify some of our spiritual experience, it gives us some vocabulary to talk about those things with your, your spiritual director about, things to pay attention to in terms of the uplifting movements or those heavy and dark movements that are happening to us, as well as the kinds of words that are coming to us interiorly helps us to hold on to that, and then it helps to give us some direction. Again, that rule number five is so helpful. I'll just mention to you a couple of the other rules which will resonate and make sense without having them written out here. You'll be able to remember them easily. Rule number 13 is share everything with your spiritual director 
or with a close spiritual companion, a spiritual friend, the enemy loves to work in the darkness. And so when we're feeling that temptation, that heaviness, that doubt, that despair, we're starting to think about making those decisions, changing our spiritual plans. Maybe the enemy brings up some embarrassing things or things that we want to keep hidden. Bring it all out. Let there be someone in your life that you share everything with, that you're not afraid to really open your heart with and bring it into the light. Because just like the light scatters darkness, so when we bring out those temptations and darker thoughts, it has a way of just scattering that darkness. And then our spiritual director can remind us also, rule number five, persevere, persevere. We want to we wanna press through. Another uh, rule that's very helpful for us is that even though we might want to persevere externally and not make a change, we also want to make a change internally in the sense of resisting desolation. We want to reaffirm the goodness of God through much meditation. We also want to just ask for help. If you're feeling that desolation, just ask the Lord, please help me. Lift this desolation. I'm struggling, suffering. Just that little petitionary prayer can be a great help. Another thing we can do is make some examination. Is there some reason that I'm going through this? There was one man, a businessman, who had a practice every day of going to pray during his lunchtime. It was something that he came to through some prayer and discernment. In that time of consolation, he thought, I really need to spend more time. I have this lunch hour pretty much every day. I'm going to take a half an hour of that and just go to, uh, to the church and spend that time in prayer. But then something comes up and he starts uh, canceled his, his prayer time one day. And then his colleagues invited him out, and he thought, well, that'll be a good thing to go out with them. The conversation was not very upbuilding and started to drag him down a little bit. Anyway, he went back to work. The next day, another thing came up, and then he started looking for his colleagues to go out to lunch. And slowly, this practice he had committed to got worn away. And then it was finally the desolation that woke him up, and he said, huh. Oh, well, I've wandered away from my prayer time for the last two weeks. Maybe that has something to do with the desolation that I'm experiencing. Not every desolation is our own fault, but sometimes the Lord is kind of waking us up by allowing us to face the, that temptation, and it's trying to wake us up to get us back to those spiritual resolutions and spiritual practices. So another thing we can do is look at that, internally. And then a fourth thing that we can do is maybe a little bit of penance. Sometimes we're there in prayer and we're really thinking about how we can cut that holy hour short to 45 minutes and we're trying to find some excuses to do that and 15 are coming to our mind as we're feeling like my prayer time is just useless, I can't focus anyway, I keep falling asleep and this is too difficult. Resist the desolation and make a decision to stay for an hour and two minutes. That's a little penance. That's a little push against the desolation and say, no, I'm not going to give in to this and start compromising and thinking how I can back out. I'm going to push against this and persevere just a little bit longer. So that's how we can push back internally against those kinds of temptations and that kind of desolation in our hearts. Uh, and then Ignatius also tells us, you know, uh, God always gives us enough grace. Sometimes we feel left to our own designs, to our own efforts. God always gives us enough grace not to give in to temptation. God always gives us enough grace to, to persevere, so we can trust in that and push forward in that. So I just want to uh, focus on those things and then just make a couple of final comments on this, uh, on the bottom of our sheet actually kind of dovetailing on what Father Tom said at the end of last night, that all of this work of, on our interior life, as we become more aware of what's happening inside of us, and we're, we're growing in our, our self-knowledge and our awareness of God's presence in our lives and the temptations against the commandments or against the resolutions that we've made, as we're becoming aware of all of this, it really finds its culmination it finds its fullness in being able to share it. 
So this is the, an insight from John Paul II's theology of the body. He describes, first of all, interprets, helps us to understand that first, uh, this, or the second chapter of Genesis, Adam was created alone in the beginning, in the garden, and Adam is created with uh, an, an opportunity for self-discovery in the Lord's presence. He's, he's coming to understand, he's taking in the commandment of God, and he's processing that, and he's living out the, uh, the commandment of God not to eat from the tree. It gives him this kind of moral reflection, and he's reflecting on the commandment of God to name all of the animals, and that helps him to realize that he's different than all of the animals. There's something about him and his capacity to understand forms and being and to reflect on the nature of things and to recognize that you know three different apes are still in the same category. We'll call them ape, you know, all these sort of philosophical qualities. He has intellect and he has free will. Man's discovering all of that on his own in the garden. But then God makes this observation. It's not good for man to be alone. And in saying that, he's saying there's a process that man is going through that's not done yet, <coughs> that's not done until he's encountering another, someone who is different than himself. Now, there are a number of things going on in that, and male and female, and ultimately Adam and Eve coming together, but in a very simple way, we're made for a communion of persons. We're made to be able to share these things, those discoveries of our interiority, we're made to be able to share them with someone else. Again, this is where spiritual direction is such an important part of our ministry, offering other people that opportunity to share what's happening in their interior life, what's happening in their original solitude, which is their relationship with God, and to be able to share what's, what's going on. So John Paul II says, our communion of persons means living in a relationship of reciprocal gift. And this relationship is precisely the fulfillment of man's original solitude. So we're made to be a gift, to be able to share that with somebody who can receive the gift, who can take our experience into their hearts. And that's going to have everything to do with the way that we listen and the way that we make room for other people inside of us. And then just another reinforcement of that, John Paul II says, uh, Man becomes an image of God not so much in the moment of solitude as in the moment of communion. Traditional theology has identified our intellect and will, free will, as being our image and likeness of God. John Paul II takes that another step and he says it's not just that intellect and will on our own, but it's really being in communion with another person we're especially in the image of God. Because, as we know, in Christ, who has revealed that God in himself is a relationship of three persons, three persons in one God. He goes on to say, man is in fact from the beginning not only an image in which the solitude of one person who rules the world mirrors itself, but also and essentially the image of an inscrutable divine communion of persons. So again, we're really in the image of God, especially when we're in communion with another. So all of that beautiful interiority and individuality and uniqueness and self-sovereignty and free will and all of those beautiful qualities in us that are really meant to be in communion. And so having a relationship in which we can really share the fullness of ourselves, the depths of our hearts, that we can have that spiritual friendship perhaps or spiritual direction or spiritual companionship or whatever there's a I think there's a kind of gradient of some of these or a, uh, a spectrum of some of these things but in any event somebody that we can really share our interiority with who can help us then to hear what God is saying through our experience as we really embody that feel that and think that as we are aware of the things that are that are happening inside of us I want to give Father Tom a, an opportunity to share a few thoughts as well, and then we'll have uh, another opportunity, I think, for some personal meetings, and then we'll continue with a little more teaching this afternoon. I know we all would like to thank Father Boniface for his 
very lucid presentation of uh, St. Ignatius Loyola and the discernment, but even more importantly, the deepening in prayer. You know, so often we come to prayer, of course, with our needs and trying to figure out, trying to discern things of that nature. And yet what the Lord wants most of all is not only to lead us through our lives, but he wants to draw us into a deeper communion with him. And it is actually by coming into that deeper communion with him that we will know what we are to do moment by moment. And that happens because, as Father Bonavis said so beautifully, the persons of the Trinity are in an infinitely intimate, if you will, an infinitely self Pour, outpouring love that they are one God. And the closer and more deeply we are drawn into communion with Christ, most especially through the Eucharist. We call the Eucharist Holy Communion. We are drawn into that intimacy with Him, and then we become more and more transparent. You know, it is a day full of light with the beautiful sunshine and with the liturgy and the gathering together in community. And the Lord wants to bring us to the faith, to the hope, and to the love that makes us more and more transparent. And transparency, as we know, allows the light to come through. When something is opaque, it in some ways keeps out the light. And in our own hearts and souls, there can be places that are opaque or are even completely dark. And the Lord wants us to come fully out into the light, and that means to come fully into communion with Him. An absolute transparency of love. So, uh, is there time for questions, or do we want to go directly to... Okay, about 10 minutes. Uh, Bishop, did you want to bring in questions? Any quick questions for the maybe two priests? Uh, deacon, some deacon and the deacon. Um, I've, I've heard the metaphor that you use about, about God always gives you the grace to get through your problems, etc., etc. And I've heard that a thousand times, but I've never been able to find exactly how the people who use that metaphor know that. Christ never said that. And, and I mean, and I've like tried to find out, like, how do these people know that? Well, I said that Christ always gives us the grace to resist temptation, to not fall into sin. He gives us what we need to uh, not commit sin with our will. So that doesn't mean that we never even have any sinful actions, sometimes our will even is compromised. But uh, God always gives us enough grace to not commit sin. That getting through our problems may be another question. I mean, how sometimes do you even know that? How, how, how do you even know that? I mean, how do people know that? I, I just want to know how they know. That's all I want to know. Well, that is an extremely good question. And, um, you know, there, there basically is, as we talked about, you know, living in Christ. And so, when I am struggling with an issue, and I am feeling that it has power over me, and I cry out to the Lord, I have done this. There have been times in my life when I have simply said, I can't go on. And so all I could do at those moments was cry out to the Lord, you know, Lord, you're going to have to help me. And there tended to be a calming. And later in the day, when I look back on that experience, there was a certitude that came to me. There was a conviction. There was a Hope coming out of nowhere. 
Hope I didn't talk myself into or work myself into, but hope that just came. Grace is basically a sharing in divine life, a participation in divine life. And there are moments, and you, you ask very, very well, and, and Father Bonifus, I think, was saying this in trying to talk about the consolations, when somehow we know that he is there, you know, uh, when, when we know that he is helping us when we know we heard our cry. Now that's an extreme experience. But in ordinary ways, in everyday life, I don't know about you, but when I'm out of gas, you know, and when it's hard to go on suddenly, there is, I know I'm sure there are natural reasons. Maybe I had a cup of coffee. Maybe the sun finally came out in this God-forsaken corner of the world where the sun so seldom shines. Those things were all there. But I know that there's more than that. And that's what I call grace. It is an infusion and an intensification. We think of it quantitatively. But it's more like the light that goes everywhere and draws us into it and changes us from the inside out. And I just know that God did that. I call that grace.